Vous allez entendre Léon de Grel, qui fut avant la Première Guerre mondiale le plus jeune chef. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to hear Léon de Grel, who before the Second World War was Europe's youngest political leader and the founder of the Rexis Party of Belgium. During that cataclysmic confrontation, he was one of the greatest heroes on the Eastern Front. Of Léon de Grel, Hitler said, if I should have a son, I would like him to be like Léon. As a statesman and a soldier, he is known very closely. Hitler, Mussolini, Churchill, Franco, Laval, Marshal Patton, and all the European leaders during the enormous ideological and military clash that was World War II. Alone among them, he has survived, remaining the number one witness of that historical period. The life of Léon de Grel began in 1906 in Bouillon, a small town in the Belgian Ardennes. His family was of French origin. He studied at the University of Louvain, where he acquired a doctorate in law. He was and is also interested in other academic disciplines, such as political science, art, archaeology, and Thomistic philosophy. As a student, his natural gift of leadership became apparent. By the time he reached 20, he had already published five books and operated his own weekly newspaper. Out of his deep Christian conviction, he joined Belgium's Catholic Action Movement and became one of its leaders. But his passion has always been people. He wanted to win the crowds, particularly the Marxist ones. He wanted them to share his ideals of social and spiritual change for society. He wanted to lift people up, to forge for them a stable, efficient, and responsible state, a state backed by the good sense of the people and for the sole benefit of the people. He addressed more than 2,000 meetings, always controversial. His books and newspapers were read everywhere because they always dealt with the real issues. Although not yet 25, people listened to him avidly. In a few short years, he had won over a large part of the population. On the 24th of May, 1936, his Rexis party won against the established parties, a smashing electoral victory, 34 House and Senate seats. The Europe of 1936 was still split into little countries, jealous of their pasts, and closed to any contacts with their neighbors. Leon de Grel saw further. In his student days, he had traveled across Latin America, the United States, and Canada. He had visited North Africa, the Middle East, and of course all of the European countries. He felt that Europe had a unique destiny and must unite. Mussolini invited him to Rome, Churchill saw him in London, and Hitler received him in Berlin. Putting his political life on the line, he made desperate efforts to stop the railroading of Europe into another war. But old rivalries, petty hatreds, and suspicion between the French and the German were cleverly exploited. The established parties and the Communist Party worked on the same side for war. For the Kremlin, it was a unique opportunity to communize Europe after it had been bled white. Thus, war started, first in Poland, then in Western Europe in 1940. This was to become the Second World War in 1941. Soon, the flag of the swastika flew from the North Pole to the shores of Greece to the border of Spain. But the European civil war between England and Germany continued, and the rulers of communism got ready to move in and pick up the pieces. But Hitler beat them to it and invaded the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941. For Europe, it was to be heads or tails. Hitler wins or Stalin wins. It was then that from every country in Europe, thousands of young men made up their minds that the destiny of their native country was at stake. They would volunteer their lives to fight communism and create a united Europe. In all, they would grow to be more than 600,000 non-German Europeans fighting on the Eastern Front. They would bring scores of divisions to the Waffen-SS. The Waffen-SS were the ideological and military shock troops of Europe. The Germans, numbering 400,000, were actually in the minority. The one million strong Waffen-SS represented the first truly European army to ever exist. After the war, each unit of this army was to provide their people with a political structure free of the petty nationalism of the past. All the SS fought the same struggle. All shared the same world view. All became comrades in arms. The most important political and military phenomenon of World War II is also the least known the phenomenon of the Waffen-SS. Leon de Grel is one of the most famous Waffen-SS soldiers. After joining as a private, he earned all stripes from corporal to general for exceptional bravery in combat. He engaged in 75 hand-to-hand -hand combat actions. He was wounded on numerous occasions. He was the recipient of the highest honors, the Ritter Cruz, the Oak Leaves, the Gold German Cross, and numerous other decorations for outstanding valor under enemy fire. One of the last to fight on the Eastern Front, Leon de Grel escaped unconditional surrender by flying some 1,500 miles across Europe towards Spain. He managed to survive constant fire all along the way and crash landed on the beach of San Sebastian in Spain, critically wounded. Against all odds, he survived. Slowly, he managed to rebuild a new life in exile for himself and his family. For de Grel, philosophy and politics cannot exist without historical knowledge. For him, beauty enhances people and people cannot improve their lives without it. 
This philosophy is reflected in everything he does. In his Spanish home, art blends gracefully with history. The work of Leon de Grel has always been epic and poetic. As he walks in the environment of his home, one feels the greatness of Rome with its marbles, its bronzes, its translucent glass. One feels the elegant Arabian architecture, the gravity of the Gothic form, and the sumptuousness of Renaissance and Baroque art. One feels the glory of his flags. In this atmosphere of beauty and greatness, the last and most important living witness of World War II awaits you. Ladies and gentlemen, General Leon de Grel. Mesdames, Mesdemoiselles, Messieurs, bonjour. I am asked to talk to you about the great unknown of World War II, the Waffen SS. It is somewhat amazing that the organization, which was both political and military, and which during World War II united more than one million fighting volunteers, should still be officially ignored. Why is it that the official record still virtually ignores this extraordinary army of volunteers? An army which was at the vortex of the most gigantic struggle affecting the entire world. The answer may well be found in the fact that the most striking feature of the Waffen SS was that it was composed of volunteers from some 30 different countries. What cause gathered them and why did they volunteer their lives? Was it a German phenomenon? At the beginning, yes. Initially, the Waffen SS amounted to less than 200 members. It grew consistently until 1940, when it evolved into a second phase, the Germanic Waffen SS. In addition to Germans from Germany, Northwestern Europeans, descendants of Germans from all across Europe, enlisted. Then in 1941, during the great clash with the Soviet Union, rose the European Waffen SS. Young men from the most distant countries fought together on the Russian front. No one knew anything about the Waffen SS for most of the years preceding the war. The Germans themselves took some time to recognize the distinctiveness of the Waffen SS. Hitler rose to the chancellorship democratically, winning at the ballot box. He ran electoral campaigns like any other politician. He addressed meetings, advertised on billboards. His message attracted capacity audiences. More and more people liked what he had to say and more and more people voted members of his party into Congress. Hitler did not come to power by force, but was duly elected by the people and duly installed as chancellor by the president of Germany, General von Hindenburg. His government was legitimate and democratic. In fact, only two of his followers were included in the cabinet. Later, he succeeded always through the electoral process in increasing his majority. When some elections gave him up to 90% of the vote, Hitler earned every vote on his own merit. During his campaigns, Hitler faced formidable enemies. The power establishment, who had no qualms whatsoever in tampering with the electoral process. He had to face the Weimar establishment and its well-financed left-wing and liberal parties and highly organized bloc of six million Communist Party members. Only the most fearless and relentless struggle to convince people to vote for him enabled Hitler to obtain a democratic majority. In those days, the Waffen-SS was not even a factor. There was, of course, the SA with some three million men. They were rank-and-file members of the National Socialist Workers' Party, but certainly not an army. Their main function was to protect party candidates from communist violence. And the violence was murderous indeed. More than 500 national socialists were murdered by the communists. Thousands were grievously injured. The SA was a volunteer, non-government organization, and as soon as Hitler rose to power, he could no longer avail himself of its help. He had to work within the system he was elected to serve. He came in a state of disadvantage. He had to contend with an entrenched bureaucracy appointed by the old regime. In fact, when the war started in 1939, 70% of German bureaucrats had been appointed by the old regime and did not belong to Hitler's party. Hitler could not count on the support of the church hierarchy. Both big business and the Communist Party were totally hostile to his programs. On top of all this, extreme poverty existed and six million workers were unemployed. No country in Europe had ever known so many people to be out of work. So here is a man quite isolated 
three million s a party members are not in the government they vote and help win the elections but they cannot supplant an entrenched bureaucracy in the government post the s a also was unable to exert influence on the army because the top brass fearful of competition was hostile to the s a this hostility reached such a point that hitler was faced with a wrenching dilemma what to do with the millions of followers who helped him to power he could not abandon them the army was a highly organized power structure although only numbering one hundred thousand as dictated by the treaty of versailles it exerted great influence in the affairs of state the president of germany was field marshal von hindenburg the army was a privileged caste almost all the officers belonged to the upper classes of society it was impossible for hitler to take on the powerful army frontally hitler was elected democratically and he could not do what stalin did to have firing squads execute the entire military establishment stalin killed thirty thousand high-ranking officers that was stalin's way to make room for his own trusted commissars such drastic methods could not occur in germany and unlike stalin hitler was surrounded by international enemies his election had provoked international rage he had gone to the voters directly without the intermediary of the establishment parties his party platform included an appeal for racial purity in germany as well as a return of power to the people such tenants so infuriated world jewry that in 1933 it officially declared war on germany contrary to what one is told hitler had limited power and was quite alone how this man ever survived these early years defy comprehension only the fact that hitler was an exceptional genius explains his survival against all odds abroad and at home hitler had to bend over backwards just to demonstrate his goodwill but despite all his efforts hitler was gradually being driven into a corner the feud between the sa and the army was coming to a head his old comrade ernst rome chief of the sa wanted to follow stalin's example and physically eliminate the army brass the showdown resulted in the death of rome either by suicide or murder and many of his assistants with the army picking up the pieces and putting the SA back in its place. At this time, the only SS to be found in Germany were in Chancellor Hitler's personal guard. 180 men in all. They were young men of exceptional qualities, but without any political role. Their duty consisted in guarding of chancery and to present arms to visiting dignitaries. It was from this minuscule group of 180 men that a few years later would spring an army of a million soldiers an army of unprecedented valor extending its call throughout Europe. After Hitler was compelled to acknowledge the superiority of the army, he realized that the brass would never support his revolutionary social programs. It was an army of aristocrats. Hitler was a man of the people, a man who succeeded in wiping out unemployment, a feat unsurpassed to this day. Within two years, he gave work to six million Germans and got rid of rampant poverty. In five years, the German worker doubled his income without inflation. Hundreds of thousands of beautiful homes were built for workers at minimal cost. Each home had a garden to grow flowers and vegetables. All the factories were provided with sports fields, swimming pools, and attractive and decent workshops. For the first time, paid vacations were created. The communists and the capitalists had never offered paid vacations. This was Hitler's creation. He organized the famous Strength Through Joy programs, which meant that workers could, at affordable prices, board passenger ships and visit any part of the world. All these social improvements did not please the establishment. Big business tycoons and international bankers were worried, but Hitler stood up to them. Business can make profits, but only if people are paid decently and are allowed to live and work in dignity people not profits come first this was only one of Hitler's reforms he initiated hundreds of others he literally rebuilt Germany in a few years more than 5,000 miles of freeways were built for the worker the affordable Volkswagen was created any worker could get this car on a payment of five marks per week it was unprecedented in Europe thanks to the freeways the worker 
for the first time could visit any part of germany whenever they liked the same programs applied to the farmers and middle class hitler realized that if his social reforms were to proceed free of sabotage he needed a powerful lever a lever that commanded respect hitler still did not confront the army but skillfully started to build up the ss he desperately needed the ss because above all hitler was a political man to him war was the last resort his aim was to convince people to obtain their loyalty particularly in the younger generation he knew that the establishment minded brass would oppose him at every turn and he was right through the high ranking officers the establishment plotted the overthrow of the democratically elected hitler government known as the munich plot the conspirators were detected in time that was in 1938 on july 20th 1944 hitler almost lost his life when aristocratic officers planted a time bomb underneath his desk in order not to alert the army hitler enlarged the ss into a force responsible for law and order there was of course a german police force but there again hitler was unsure of their loyalty the 150,000 police were appointed by the Weimar regime. Hitler needed the SS not only to detect plots, but mostly to protect his reforms. As his initial Liebstandart unit of 180 grew, other regiments were formed such as the Deutschland and the Germania. The army brass did everything to prevent SS recruitment. Hitler bypassed the obstacles by having the interior minister and not the war ministry do the recruiting. The army countered by discouraging the recruitment of men between the age of 18 and 45. On the ground of national defense, privates were ordered to serve four years, non-commissioned officers 12, and officers 25 years. Such orders, it was thought, would stop SS recruitment dead in its tracks. The reverse happened. Thousands of young men rushed to apply. Despite the lengthy service, more than could be accepted. The young felt the SS was the only armed force which represented their own ideas. The new formations of young SS captivated public imagination. Clad in smart black uniforms, the SS attracted more and more young men. It, it took them two years, from 1933 to 1935, and a constant battle of wits with the army to raise them to a force of 8,000. At the time, the name Waffen SS did not even exist. It was not until 1940, after the French campaign, that the SS was officially named Waffen SS. In 1935, they were just called SS. However, the 8,000 men did not go far in a country of 80 million people, and Hitler had yet to devise another way to get around the army. He created the Totenkopf Guard Corps. They were really SS in disguise, but their official function was to guard the concentration camps. What were these concentration camps? They were just work camps where intractable communists were put to work. They were well treated because it was thought they would be converted sooner or later to patriotism. There were two concentration camps with a total of 3,000 men. 3,000 out of a total of 6 million card-carrying members of the Communist Party. That represents one per 2,000. Right until the war, there were fewer than 10,000 inmates. So the Totenkopf ploy produced four regiments. At the right moment, they would join the SS. The Totenkopf kept a low profile through an elaborate system of recruiting reserves in order to keep its strength inconspicuous. At the beginning of the war, the Totenkopf numbered 40,000 men. They were sent to 163 separate units. Meanwhile, the initial Liebstandart Regiment reached 2,800, and a fourth regiment was formed in Vienna at the time of the Anschluss. The young men who joined the SS were trained like no other army in the world. Military and academic instruction were intensive, but it was the physical training that was most rigorous. They practiced sports with excellence. Each of them could have performed with distinction at the Olympic Games. The extraordinary physical endurance of the SS on the Russian front which so amazed the world, was due to their intensive training. There was also the ideological training. They were taught why they were fighting, what kind of Germany was being resurrected before their very eyes. They were shown 
how Germany was being morally united through class reconciliation and physically united through the return of their lost German homelands. They were made aware of their kinship with all other Germans living in foreign lands, in Poland, Russia, the Sudetenland, and other parts of Europe. They were taught all Germans represented an ethnic unity. Young SS were educated in two military academies, one in Bad Tolz, the other in Braunschweig. These academies were totally different from the grim barracks of the past. Combining aesthetics with the latest technology, they were located in the middle of hundreds of acres of beautiful country. Hitler was opposed to any war, particularly in Western Europe. He did not even conceive that the SS could participate in such a war. Above all, the SS was a political force. Hitler regarded Western countries as individual cultures, which could be federated, but certainly not conquered. He felt a conflict within the West would be a no-win civil war. Hitler's conception of Europe then was far ahead of his neighbors. The mentality of 1914 to 1918, when small countries fought other small countries over bits of real estate, still prevailed in the Europe of 1939. Not so in the case of the Soviet Union, where internationalism replaced nationalism. The communists never aimed at serving the interests of Russia. Communism does not limit itself to acquire chunks of territories, but aims at total world domination. This is a dramatically new factor. This policy of world conquest is still being carried out today, whether in Vietnam, Afghanistan, Africa, or Poland. At the time, it was an entirely new concept. Alone among all the leaders of the world, Hitler saw this concept as an equal threat to all nations. Hitler recalled vividly the havoc the communists unleashed in Germany at the end of World War I, particularly in Berlin and Bavaria. The communists under foreign orders organized a state within a state and almost took over. For Hitler, everything pointed east. The threat was communism. Apart from his lack of interest in subjugating Western Europe, Hitler was well aware that he could not wage war on two fronts. At this point, instead of letting Hitler fight communism, the Allies made the fateful decision to attack Hitler. The so-called Western democracies allied themselves with the Soviet Union for the purpose of encircling and destroying the democratic government of Germany. The Treaty of Versailles had already amputated Germany from all sides. It was designed to keep Germany in a state of permanent economic collapse and military impotence. The Allies had ratified a string of treaties with Belgium, the newly created Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Poland and Romania to pressure Germany from all sides. Then, in the summer of 1939, the governments of Britain and France were secretly negotiating a full military alliance with the Soviet Union. The talks were held in Moscow, and the minutes were signed by Marshal Zhukov. I have these minutes in my possession. They are stupefying. One can read this report which guaranteed to Britain and France Soviet participation against Germany. Upon ratification, the Soviet Union was to provide the Anglo-French forces with the Soviet support of 5,500 combat planes immediately, plus the backup of the entire Soviet Air Force. Between 9,000 to 10,000 tanks would also be made available. In return, the Soviet Union demanded the Baltic states and free access to Poland. The plan called for an early joint attack. Germany was still minimally armed at that stage. The French negotiators realized that the 10,000 Soviet tanks would soon destroy the 2,000 German tanks, but did not see that they would unlikely stop at the French border. Likewise, the British government was quite prepared to let the Soviets take over Europe. Facing total encirclement, Hitler decided once more to make his own peace with one or the other side of the Soviet-British partnership. He first turned to the British and French governments and requested formal peace talks. His quest for peace was answered by an outpouring of insults and denunciations. The international press went on an orgy of hate against Hitler, unprecedented in history. It is mind-boggling to reread these newspapers today. When Hitler made similar peace overtures to Moscow, he was surprised to find the Soviets eager to sign a peace treaty with Germany. In fact, Stalin did not sign a peace treaty for the purpose of peace. He signed to let Europe destroy itself in a war of attrition while giving him the time he needed to build up his military strength. 
Stalin's real intent is revealed in the minutes of the Soviet High Command, which are also in my possession. Stalin states his intent to come into the war the moment Hitler and the Western powers have annihilated each other. Stalin had great interest in marking time and letting the others fight first. I have read his military plans and I have seen how they were achieved. By 1941, Stalin's 10,000 tanks had increased to 17,999. The next year they would have been 32,000, 10 times more than Germany's. The Air Force would also have been 10 to 1 in Stalin's favor. The very week Stalin signed the peace treaty with Hitler, he gave orders to build 96 airfields on the Western Soviet border. 180 were planned for the following year. His strategy was constant. Quote, the more the Western powers fight it out, the weaker they would be. The longer I wait, the stronger I get. It is under these appalling circumstances that World War II started, a war which was offered to the Soviets on a silver platter. Aware of Stalin's preparations, Hitler knew he would have to face communism sooner rather than later. And to fight communism, he had to rely on totally loyal men, men who would fight for an ideology against another ideology. It had always been Hitler's policy to oppose the ideology of class war with an ideology of cooperation. Hitler had observed that Marxist class war had not brought prosperity to the Russian people. Russian workers were poorly clothed, as they are now, badly housed, badly fed. Goods were always in short supply, and to this day, housing in Moscow is as nightmarish as it was before the war. For Hitler, the failure of class war made class cooperation the only just alternative. To make it work, Hitler saw to it that one class would not be allowed to abuse the other. It is a fact that the newly rich classes emerging from the Industrial Revolution had enormously abused their privileges, and it was for this reason that the National Socialists were socialists. National Socialism was a popular movement in the truest sense. The great majority of National Socialists were blue collars. Seventy percent of the Hitler youth were children of blue collar workers. Hitler won the elections because the great mass of workers were solidly behind him. One often wonders why six million communists who had voted against Hitler turned their back on communism after Hitler had been elected in 1933. There is only one reason. They witnessed and experienced the benefits of class cooperation. Some say they were forced to change. It is not true. Like other loyal Germans, they fought four years on the Russian front with distinction. The workers never abandoned Hitler, but the upper class did. Hitler spelled out his formula of class cooperation as the answer to communism with these words. Class cooperation means that capitalists will never again treat the workers as mere economic components. Money is but one part of our economic life. The workers are more than machines to whom one throws a pay packet every week. The real wealth of Germany is its workers. Hitler replaced gold with work as the foundation of his economy. National Socialism was the exact opposite of communism. Extraordinary achievements followed Hitler's election. We always hear about Hitler in the camps, Hitler and the Jews, but we never hear about his immense social work. It is obvious that a genuine popular movement like National Socialism was going to collide with the selfish interest of high finance. Hitler made clear that the control of money did not convey the right of rapacious exploitation of an entire country because there are also people living in the country, millions of them, and these people have the right to live with dignity and without want. What Hitler said and practiced had won over the German youth. It was this social revolution that the SS felt compelled to spread throughout Germany and defend with their lives, if need be. The 1939 war in Western Europe defied all reason. It was a civil war among those who should have been united. It was a monstrous stupidity. The young SS were trained to lead the new National Socialist Revolution. In five or ten years, they were to replace all those who had been put in office by the former regime. But at the beginning of the war, it was not possible for these young men to stay home. Like other young men in the country, they had to defend their country, and they had to defend it better than the others. The war turned the SS from a home political force to a national army fighting abroad, 
and then to a supranational army. We are now at the beginning of the war in Poland with its far-reaching consequences. Could the war have been avoided? Emphatically, yes. Even after it had moved into Poland. The Danzig conflict was inconsequential. The Treaty of Versailles had separated the German city of Danzig from Germany and given it to Poland against the wish of its citizens. This action was so outrageous that it had been condemned all over the world. A large section of Germany was sliced through the middle. To go from Western Prussia to Eastern Prussia, one had to travel in a sealed train through Polish territory. The citizens of Danzig had voted 99% to have their city returned to Germany. Their right of self-determination had been consistently ignored. However, the war in Poland started for reasons other than Danzig's self-determination, or even Poland's. Poland, just a few months earlier, had attacked Czechoslovakia at the same time Hitler had returned to the Sudetenland to Germany. The Poles were ready to work with Hitler. If Poland turned against Germany, it is because the British government did everything in its power to poison German-Polish relations. But why? Much of it has to do with a long-standing inferiority complex that British rulers have felt towards Europe. This complex has manifested itself in the British establishment's obsession in keeping Europe weak through wars and dissension. At that time, the British Empire controlled 500 million human beings outside of Europe, but somehow it was more preoccupied with its traditional hobby, sowing dissension in Europe. This policy of never allowing the emergence of a strong European country has been the British establishment's modus operandi for centuries. Whether it was Charles V of Spain, Louis XIV or Napoleon of France, or William II of Germany, the British establishment never tolerated any unifying power in Europe. Germany never wanted to meddle in British affairs. However, the British establishment always made it a point to meddle in European affairs, particularly in Central Europe and the Balkans. Hitler's entry into Prague brought the British running to the fray. Prague and Bohemia had been part of Germany for centuries and always within the German sphere of influence. British meddling in this area was totally unjustified. For Germany, the Prague regime represented a grave threat. Venice, Stalin's servile Czech lackey, had been ordered by his Kremlin masters to open his borders to the communist armies at a moment's notice. Prague was to be the Soviet springboard to Germany. For Hitler, Prague was the watchtower to Central Europe and an advance post to delay a Soviet invasion. There was also Prague's historical economic links with Germany. Germany had always had economic links with Central Europe. Romania, the Balkans, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Yugoslavia have had long-standing complementary economies with Germany, which have functioned to this day. Hitler's European economic policy was based on common sense and realism and it was Hitler's emerging Central European common market rather than concern for Czech freedom that the British establishment could not tolerate. Yet English people feel great admiration for Hitler. I remember when Lloyd George addressed the German press outside Hitler's home where he had just been a guest. He stated, you can thank God you have such a wonderful man as your leader. Lloyd George, the enemy of Germany during World War I said that. King Edward VIII of England, who had just abdicated and was now the Duke of Windsor, also came to see Hitler at his Berchtesgaden home, accompanied by his wife, who incidentally had been used to force his abdication. When they returned, the Duke sent a wire to Hitler. It read, What a wonderful day we have spent with Your Excellency. Unforgettable. The Duke reflected what many English people knew when he remarked on how well off the German workers were. The Duke was telling the truth. The German worker earned twice as much without inflation as he did before Hitler and consequently his standard of living was high. Even Churchill, the most fanatic German hater of them all, had in 1938, a year before the war, sent a letter to Hitler in which he wrote, if ever Great Britain was plunged into a disaster comparable to the one that afflicted Germany in 1918, I would ask God that he should send us a man with the strength and the character of Your Excellency. 
the London Times reported this extraordinary statement. Friend or foe, all acknowledged that Hitler was a man of exceptional genius. His achievements were the envy of the world. In five short years, he rebuilt a bankrupt nation burdened with millions of unemployed into the strongest economic power in Europe. It was so strong that Germany was able to withstand a war against the whole world for six years. Churchill acknowledged that no one in the world could match such a feat. He stated just before the war, there is no doubt we can work out a peace formula with Hitler. But Churchill received other instructions. The establishment, fearful that Hitler's successes in Germany could spread to other countries, was determined to destroy him. It created hatred against Germany across Europe by stirring old grievances. It also exploited some envy that Europeans felt toward Germany. The Germans' high birth rate had made Germany the most populous country in Western Europe. In science and technology, Germany was ahead of both France and Britain. Hitler had built Germany into an economic powerhouse. That was Hitler's crime, and the British establishment opted to destroy Hitler and Germany by any means. The British manipulated the Polish government against Germany. The Poles themselves were more than willing to live in peace with the Germans. Instead, the unfortunate Poles were railroaded into war by the British. One must not forget that one and a half million Germans lived in Poland at the time. At great benefit to the Polish economy, apart from economic ties with Germany, the Poles saw a chance that with Germany's help they would be able to recover their Polish territories from the Soviet Union, territories they had tried to recover in vain since 1919. In January 1939, Hitler had proposed to Beck, the Polish leader, a compromise to solve the Danzig issue. The Danzigers' vote to return to Germany would be honored, and Poland would continue to have free port access and facilities, guaranteed by treaty. The prevailing notion of the day that every country must have a seaport really does not make sense. Switzerland, Hungary, and other countries with no seaports managed quite well. Hitler's proposals were based on the principles of self-determination and reciprocity. Even Churchill admitted that such a solution could dispose of the Danzig problem. This admission, however, did not prevent him from sending an ultimatum to Germany, withdraw from Poland or war. The world has recently seen what happened when Israel invaded Lebanon. Heavily populated cities like Tyr and Sidon were destroyed, and so was West Beirut. Everybody called for Israel's withdrawal, but no one declared war on Israel when it refused to budge. With a little patience, a peaceful solution would have been found for Danzig. Instead, the international press unleashed a massive campaign of outright lies and distortions against Hitler. His proposals were willfully misrepresented by a relentless press onslaught. Of all the crimes of World War II, one never hears about the wholesale massacres that occurred in Poland just before the war. I have detailed reports in my files documenting the mass slaughter of defenseless Germans in Poland. Thousands of German men, women, and children were massacred in the most horrendous fashion by press-enraged mobs. The photographs of these massacres are too sickening to look at. Hitler decided to halt the slaughter, and he rushed to the rescue. The Polish campaign showed Hitler to be a military genius. History has already started to recognize this most startling of Hitler's characteristics, his rare military genius. All the successful military campaigns of the Third Reich were thought out and directed by Hitler personally, not the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Hitler inspired a number of generals who became his most able executives in later campaigns. In regard to the Polish campaign, the general staff had planned an offensive along the Baltic coastline in order to take Danzig, a plan logistically doomed to failure. Instead, Hitler invented the Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War, and in no time captured Warsaw. The Waffen-SS appeared on the Polish front, and its performance amazed the world. The second campaign in France was also swift and humane. The British-French forces had rushed to Holland and Belgium to check the German advance, but they were outwitted and outflanked in Sedan. It was all over in a matter of days. The story goes that Hitler had nothing to do with this operation, that it was all the work of General von Manstein. That is entirely false. Marshal von Manstein had indeed conceived the idea, 
for when he submitted it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was reprimanded, demoted, and retired to Dresden. The General Staff had not brought this particular incident to Hitler's attention. On his own, Hitler ran a campaign along the same lines and routed the British-French forces. It was not until March 1940 that von Manstein came into contact with Hitler. Hitler also planned the Balkan and Russian campaigns. On rare occasions where Hitler allowed the general staff to have their way, such as in Kirsch, the battle was lost. In the 1939 Polish campaign, Hitler did not rely on military textbook theories devised 50 years ago, as advocated by the general staff, but on his own plan of swift, pincher-like encirclement. In eight days, the Polish war was over, in spite of the fact that Poland is as large as France. The eight-day campaign saw three SS regiments in action, the Liebstandart, the Deutschland, and the Germania. There was also an SS motorbike battalion, a corps of engineers, and a transmission unit. In all, it was a comprehensive but small force of 25,000 men. Sepp Dietrich and his Liebstandart alone had, after bolting out of Silesia, split Poland in half within days. With less than 3,000 men, he had defeated a Polish force of 15,000 and taken 10,000 prisoners. Such victories were not achieved without loss. It is hard to imagine that from a total of 1 million SS, 352,000 were killed in action with 50,000 more missing. It is a grim figure. 400,000 of the finest young men in Europe, without hesitation, they sacrificed themselves for their beliefs. They knew they had to give an example. They were the first on the front line as a way to defend their country and their ideals. In victory or defeat, the Waffen-SS always sought to be the best representatives of their people. The SS was a democratic expression of power, people gathering of their own free will. The consent of the ballot box is not only this, there is consent of the heart and the mind of men. In action, the Waffen-SS made a plebiscite that the German people should be proud of them, should give them their respect and their love. Such high motivation made the volunteers of the Waffen-SS the best fighters in the world. The SS had proved themselves in action. They were not empty talking politicians, but they gave their lives, the first to go in the fight in an extraordinary spurt of comradeship. This comradeship was one of the most distinctive characteristics of the SS. The SS leader was the comrade of the others. It was on the front lines that the results of the SS physical training could really be noticed. An SS officer had the same rigorous training as the soldiers. Those officers and privates competed in the same sports events, and only the best man won, regardless of rank. This created a real brotherhood which literally energized the entire Waffen SS. Only the teamwork of free men, bonded by a higher ideal, could unite Europe. Look at the common market of today. It is a failure. There is no unifying ideal. Everything is based on haggling over the price of tomatoes, steel, coal, or booze. Fruitful unions are based on something a little higher than that. The relationship of equality and mutual respect between soldiers and officers was always present. Half of all division commanders were killed in action. Half! There is not an army in the world where this happened. The SS officer always led his troops into battle. I was engaged in 75 hand-to-hand -hand combats because, as an SS officer, I had to be the first to meet the enemy. SS soldiers were not sent to slaughter by behind-the-line officers. They followed their officers with passionate loyalty. Every SS commander knew and taught all his men and often received unexpected answers. After breaking out of Cherkasi's siege, I talked with all my soldiers one by one there were thousands at the time. For two weeks, every day from dawn till dusk, I asked them questions. I heard their replies. Sometimes it happens that some soldiers who brag a little receive medals, while others, heroes, who keep quiet, miss out. I talked to all of them because I wanted to know firsthand what happened and what they had done. To be just, I had to know the truth. It was on this occasion that two of my soldiers suddenly pulled their identity cards from the Belgian resistance movement. They had been sent to kill me. At the front line, it is very simple to shoot someone in the back, but the extraordinary SS team spirit had won them over. 
SS officers could expect the loyalty of their men by their example. The life expectancy of an SS officer at the front was three months. In Estonia, I received 10 new young officers from Bad Tolts Academy one Monday. By Thursday, one was left and he was wounded. In the conventional armies, officers talked at the men from superior to inferior and seldom as brothers in combat and brothers in ideology. Thus, by 1939, the Waffen-SS had earned general admiration and respect. This gave Hitler the opportunity to call for an increase in their numbers. Instead of regiments, there would be three divisions. Again, the army brass laid down draconian recruiting conditions. SS could only join for not less than four years of combat duty. The brass felt that no one would take such a risk. Again, they guessed wrong. In the month of February 1940 alone, 49,000 joined the SS. From 25,000 in September 1939, there would be 150,000 in May 1940. Thus, from 180 to 8,000 to 25,000 to 150,000, and eventually one million men against all odds. Hitler had no interest whatever in getting involved with the war in France, a war forced on him. The 150,000 SS had to serve under the army, and they were given the most dangerous and difficult missions, despite the fact that they were provided with inferior hand arms and equipment. They had no tanks. In 1940, the Liebstandart was provided with a few scouting tanks. The SS were given wheels, and that's all. But with trucks, motorbikes, and very limited means, they were able to perform amazing feats. The Liebstandart and Der Führer regiments were sent to Holland under the leadership of Sepp Dietrich. They had to cross Dutch waterways. The Luftwaffe had dropped parachutists to hold the bridges 120 miles deep in Dutch territory. And it was vital for the SS to reach these bridges with the greatest speed. The Liebstandart would realize an unprecedented feat in 10 days, to advance 120 miles in one day. It was unheard of at the time, and the world was staggered. At that rate, German troops would reach Spain in one week. In one day, the SS had crossed all the Dutch canals on flimsy rubber rafts. Here again, SS losses were heavy. But thanks to their heroism and speed, the German army reached Rotterdam in three days. The parachutists all risked being wiped out had the SS not accomplished their lightning thrust. In Belgium, the SS regiment Der Führer faced head-on the French army, which, after falling in the Sedan trap, had rushed towards Breda, Holland. There, one would see for the first time a small, motivated army rout a large national army. It took one SS regiment and a number of German troops to throw the whole French army off balance and drive it back from Breda to Antwerp Belgium and northern France. The Liebstandart and De Führer regiments jointly advanced on the large Zealand islands between the Esco and the Rhine rivers. In a few days, they would be under control. In no time, the Liebstandart had then crossed Belgium and northern France. The second major battle of SS regiments occurred in concert with the Army Tank Division. The SS, still with their tanks, were under the command of General Rommel and General Guderian they spearheaded a thrust towards the North Sea. Sepp Dietrich and his troops had now crossed the French canals but were pinned down by the enemy in a mud field and just managed to avoid extermination. But despite the loss of many soldiers, officers, and one battalion commander, all killed in action, the Germans reached Dunkirk. Hitler was very proud of them. The following week, Hitler deployed them along the Somme River from which they would pour out across France. There again, the SS would prove itself to be the best fighting force in the world. Sepp Dietrich and the second division of the SS, Totenkopf, advanced so far, so fast, that they even lost contact with the rest of the army for three days. They found themselves in Lyon, France, a city they had to leave after the French-German peace treaty. Sepp Dietrich and a handful of SS on trucks had achieved the impossible. Der Führer SS division spearheaded the Maginot Line breakthrough. Everyone had said the line was impenetrable. The war in France was over. 
Hitler had the three SS divisions march through Paris. Berlin also honored their heroes. But the army was so jealous that it would not cite a single SS for valor or bravery. It was Hitler himself who, in front of the German Congress, solemnly paid tribute to the heroism of the SS. It was on this occasion that Hitler officially recognized the name of the Waffen SS. But it was more than just a name change. The Waffen SS became Germanic, as volunteers were accepted from all Germanic countries. The SS had found out by themselves that the people of Western Europe were closely related to them. The Norwegians, the Danes, the Dutch, the Flemish, all belonged to the same Germanic family. These Germanic peoples were themselves very much impressed by the SS, and so, by the way, were the French. The people of Western Europe had marveled at this extraordinary German force with a style unlike any others. If two SS scouts would reach town ahead of everybody else on motorbikes, before presenting themselves to the local authorities, they would first clean themselves up so as to be of impeccable appearance. The people could not help but be impressed. The admiration felt by young Europeans of Germanic stock for the SS was very natural. Thousands of young men from Norway, Denmark, Flanders, and Holland were awed with surprise and admiration. They felt irresistibly drawn to the SS. It was not Europe, but their own Germanic race that so deeply stirred their souls. They identified with the victorious Germans. To them, Hitler was the most exceptional man ever seen. Hitler understood them and had the remarkable idea to open the doors to the SS for them. It was quite risky. No one had ever thought of this before. Prior to Hitler, German imperialism consisted only of peddling goods to other countries without any thought of creating an ideology called community, a common ideal with its neighbors. Suddenly, instead of peddling and haggling, here was a man who offered a glorious ideal, an enthralling social justice for which they all had yearned in vain for years. A broad new order, instead of a formless cosmopolitanism of the pre-war so-called democracies. The response to Hitler's offer was overwhelming. Legions from Norway, Denmark, Holland, and Flanders were formed. Thousands of young men now wore the SS uniform. Hitler created specifically for them the famous Viking Division, one destined to become one of the most formidable divisions of the Waffen-SS. The army was still doing everything to stop men from joining the SS in Germany and acted as though the SS did not exist. Against this background of obstructionism at home, it was normal and understandable that the SS would welcome men from outside Germany. The Germans living abroad provided a rich source of volunteers. As there are millions of German Americans, there are millions of Germans in all parts of Europe, in Hungary, in Romania, in Russia. There was even a Soviet Republic of the Volga Germans. These were the descendants of Germans who had emigrated two centuries before. Other Europeans, like the French Huguenots, who went to Prussia, also shared this type of immigration with the Germans. So Europe was dotted with German settlements. The victories of the Third Reich had made them proud of belonging to the German family. Hitler welcomed them home. He saw them first as a source of elite SS men, and also as an important factor in unifying all Germans ideologically. Here again, the enthusiastic response was amazing. 300,000 volunteers of German ancestry would join from all over Europe, 54,000 from Romania alone. In the context of that era, these were remarkable figures. There were numerous problems to overcome. For instance, most of the Germanic volunteers no longer spoke German. Their families had settled in foreign lands for 200 years or so. In Spain, for instance, I can see the children of my legionaries being assimilated with the Spaniards, and their grandchildren no longer speak French. The Germans followed the same pattern. When the German volunteers first arrived at the SS, they spoke many different languages and had different ways and different needs. How could they find officers who could speak all these languages? How could they coordinate such a desperate lot? The mastery of these problems was the miracle of the Waffen-SS assimilation program. This homecoming of the separated tribes was seen by the Waffen-SS as the foundation for real European unity. The 300,000 Germanic volunteers were welcomed by the SS as brothers, and they reciprocated by being as dedicated, loyal, and heroic as the German SS. Within the year, everything had changed for the Waffen-SS. 
The barracks were full, the academies were full, the strictest admission standards and requirements equally applied for the Germanic volunteers. They had to be the best in every way, both physically and mentally. They had to be the best of the Germanic race. German racialism has been deliberately distorted. It was never anti-other race racialism. It was a pro-German racialism. It was concerned with making the German race strong and healthy in every way. Hitler was not interested in having millions of degenerates. If it was in his power not to have them. Today one finds rampant alcohol and drug addiction everywhere. Hitler cared that German families be healthy, cared that they raise healthy children for the renewal of a healthy nation. German racialism meant rediscovering the creative values of their own race, rediscovering their culture. It was a search for excellence, a noble idea. National socialist racialism was not against the other races. It was for its own race. It aimed at defending and improving its race and wished that all other races did the same for themselves. That was demonstrated when the Waffen-SS enlarged its ranks to include 60,000 Islamic SS. The Waffen-SS respected their way of life, their customs, and their religious beliefs. Each Islamic SS battalion had an imam. Each company had a mullah. It was our common wish that their qualities found their highest expression. This was our racialism. I was present when each of my Islamic comrades received a personal gift from Hitler during the new year. It was a pendant with a small Koran. Hitler was honoring them with this small symbolic gift. He was honoring them with what was the most important aspect of their lives and their history. National socialist racialism was loyal to the German race and totally respected all other races. At, at this point, one hears, what about anti-Jewish racism? One can answer, what about Jewish anti-Gentilism? It has been the misfortune of the Jewish race that never could they get on with any other race. It is an unusual historical fact and phenomenon. When one studies the history, and I say this without any passion, of the Jewish people, their evolution across the centuries, one observes that always and at all times and all places, they were hated. They were hated in ancient Egypt. They were hated in ancient Greece. They were hated in Roman times to such a degree that 3,000 of them were deported to Sardinia. It was the first Jewish deportation. They are hated in Spain, in France, in England, and in Germany. The conscientious Jewish author Lazar wrote a very interesting book on anti-Semitism, where he asked himself, we Jews should ask ourselves a question. Why are we always hated everywhere? It is not because of our persecutors, all of different times and places. It is because there is something within us that is very unlikable. What is unlikable is that the Jews have always wanted to live as a privileged class, divinely chosen and beyond scrutiny. This attitude has made them unlikable everywhere. The Jewish race is therefore a unique case. Hitler had no intention of destroying it. He, he wanted the Jews to find their own identity in their own environment, but not to the detriment of others. The fight, if we can call it that, of National Socialism against the Jews was purely limited to one objective, that the Jews leave Germany in peace. It was planned to give them a country of their own outside Germany. Madagascar was contemplated, but the plans were dropped when the United States entered the war. In the meanwhile, Hitler thought of letting the Jews live in their own traditional ghettos. They would have their own organizations, they would run their own affairs, and live the way they wanted to live. The Jews had their own police, their own tramways, their own flag, their own factories, which, incidentally, were built by the German government. As far as other races were concerned, they were all welcomed in Germany as guests, but not as privileged occupants. In one year, the Waffen-SS had gathered a large number of Germanic people from Northern Europe and hundreds of thousands of Germans from outside Germany called Volksdeutsch. It is then that the conflict between communism and national socialism burst into the open. The conflict had always existed. In Mein Kampf, Hitler had clearly set out his objective to eliminate the world threat of communism and, incidentally, claim some land in Eastern Europe. This eastward expansionism created much outrage. How could the Germans claim land in Russia? To this one can answer, how could the Americans claim Indian land from the Atlantic to the Pacific? How could France claim southern Flanders and Roussillon from Spain? And what of Britain? 
And what of so many other countries who have claimed, conquered, and settled in other territories? Somehow at the time it was all right for these countries to settle foreign lands, but it was not for Germany. Personally, I have always vigorously defended the Russians, and I finally did succeed in convincing Hitler that Germans had to live in peace with the Russians, as partners, not as conquerors. Before achieving this partnership, there was first the matter of wiping out communism. During the Soviet-German pact, Hitler was trying to gain time, but the Soviets were intensifying their acts of aggression from Estonia to Bukovina. I now read extracts from Soviet documents. They are most revealing. Let's read from Marshal Vorsholov himself. We now have time to prepare ourselves to be the executioner of the capitalist world while it is agonizing. We must, however, be cautious. The Germans must not have any inkling that we are preparing to stab them in the back while they are busy fighting the French. Otherwise, they could change their general plan and attack us. In the same record, Marshal Chapanatov wrote, the coexistence between Hitler's Germany and Soviet Union is only temporary. We will not make it last very long. Marshal Timoshenko, for his part, did not want to be so hasty. Let us not forget that our war material from our Siberian factories will not be delivered until fall. This was written at the beginning of 1941, and the material was only to be delivered in the fall. The war industry, Commissar, report stated, we will not be in full production until 1942. Marshal Zhukov made this extraordinary admission. Hitler is in a hurry to invade us. He has good reasons for it. Indeed, Hitler had good reasons to invade Russia in a hurry because he realized he would be wiped out if he did not. Zhukov added, we need a few more months to rectify many of our defects before the end of 1941. We need 18 months to complete the modernization of our forces. The orders are quite precise. On the fourth session of the Supreme Soviet in 1939, it, it was decreed that army officers will serve three years and the soldiers will serve four years and the Navy personnel five years. All these decisions were made less than a month after the Soviets signed the peace treaty with Germany. Thus the Soviets pledged to peace were frantically preparing for war. More than 2,500 new concrete fortifications were built between 1939 and 1940. 160 divisions were made combat ready. 60 tank divisions were on full alert. The Germans only had 10 panzer tank divisions. In 1941, the Soviets had 17,000 tanks. And by 1942, they had 32,000. They had 92,578 pieces of artillery, and their 17,545 combat planes in 1940 outnumbered the German Air Force. It is easy to understand that with such war preparations going on, Hitler was left with only one option, invade the Soviet Union immediately or face annihilation. Hitler's Russian campaign was the last chance campaign. Hitler, Hitler did not go into Russia with any great optimism. He told me later on, when I entered Russia, I was like a man facing a shut door. I knew I had to crash through it, but without knowing what was behind it. Hitler was right. He knew the Soviets were strong, but above all, he knew they were going to be a lot stronger. 1941 was the only time Hitler had some respite. The British had not succeeded yet in expanding the war. Hitler, who never wanted the war with Britain, still tried for peace. He invited me to spend a week at his home. He wanted to discuss the whole situation and hear what I had to say about it. He spoke very simply and clearly. The atmosphere was informal and relaxed. He made you feel at home because he really enjoyed being hospitable. He buttered pieces of toast in leisurely fashion and passed them around. And although he did not drink, he went to get a bottle of champagne after each meal because he knew I enjoyed a glass at the end of it. All without fuss and with genuine friendliness. It was part of his genius that he was also a man of simple ways without the slightest affectation of a man of great humility. We talked about England. I asked him bluntly, why on earth didn't you finish the British off in Dunkirk? Everyone knew you could have wiped them out. He answered, yes, I withheld my troops and let the British escape back to England. 
The humiliation of such a defeat would have made it difficult to try for peace with them afterwards. At the same time, Hitler told me he did not want to dispel the Soviet belief that he was going to invade England. He mentioned that he even had small Anglo-German dictionaries distributed to his troops in Poland. The Soviet spies there duly reported to the Kremlin that Germany's presence in Poland was a bluff and that they were about to leave for the British Isles. On June 22, 1941, it was Russia, not England, that Germany invaded. The initial victories were swift but costly. I lived the epic struggle of the Russian front. It was a tragic epic. It was also martyrdom. The endless thousands of miles of the Russian steppes were overwhelming. We had to reach the Caucasus by foot, always under extreme conditions. In the summer, we often walked knee-deep in mud, and in winter there were below freezing temperatures. But for a matter of a few days, Hitler would have won the war in Russia by 1941, before the Battle of Moscow. Hitler had succeeded in defeating the Soviet army and taking considerable numbers of prisoners. General Guderian's tank division, which had all by itself encircled more than a million Soviet troops near Kiev, had reached Moscow right up to the city's tramway lines. It was then that suddenly an unbelievable freeze happened. 40, 42, 50 degrees Celsius below zero. This meant that not only were men freezing, but the equipment was also freezing on the spot. No tanks could move. Yesterday's mud had frozen to a solid block of ice, half a meter high, icing up the tank treads. In 24 hours, all of our tactical options had been reversed. It was at that time that masses of Siberian troops brought back from the Russian Far East were thrown against the Germans. These few fateful days of ice that made the difference between victory and defeat. Hitler owed to the Italian campaign in Greece during the fall of 1940. Mussolini was envious of Hitler's successes. It was a deep and silent jealousy. I was a friend of Mussolini. I knew him well. He was a remarkable man, but Europe was not of great concern to him. He did not like to be a spectator, watching Hitler winning everywhere. He felt compelled to do something himself, fast. Impulsively, he launched a senseless offensive against Greece. His troops were immediately defeated, but it gave the British the excuse to invade Greece, which up till now had been uninvolved in the war. From Greece, the British could bomb the Romanian oil wells, which were vital to Germany's war effort. Greece could also be used to cut off the German troops on their way to Russia. Hitler was forced to quash the threat preemptively. He had to waste five weeks in the Balkans. His victories were an incredible logistical achievement, but they delayed the start of the Russian campaign for five critical weeks. If Hitler had been able to start the campaign in time, as it was planned, he would have entered Moscow five weeks before, in the sun of early fall, when the earth was still dry. The war would have been over, and the Soviet Union would have been a thing of the past. The combination of the sudden freeze and the arrival of fresh Siberian troops spread panic among some of the old army generals. They wanted to retreat to 200 miles away from Moscow. It is hard to imagine such insane strategy. The freeze affected Russia equally from west to east, and to retreat 200 miles in the open steppes would only make things worse. I was commanding my troops in the Ukraine at the time, and it was 42 degrees centigrade below zero. Such a retreat meant abandoning all heavy artillery, including assault tanks and panzers that were stuck in the ice. It also meant exposing half a million men to heavy Soviet sniping. In fact, it meant condemning them to certain death. One need only recall Napoleon's retreat in October. He reached the Berzina River in November, and by December 6, all the French troops had left Russia. It was cold enough, but it was not a winter campaign. Can you just imagine in 1941 half a million Germans fighting howling snowstorms, cut off from supplies, attacked from all sides by tens of thousands of Cossacks? I have faced charging Cossacks, and only the utmost superior firepower will stop them. In order to counter such an insane retreat, Hitler had to fire more than 30 generals within a few days. It was then that he called on the Waffen-SS to fill in the gap and boost morale. Immediately, the SS held fast on the Moscow front. Right through the war, the Waffen-SS never retreated. They would rather die than retreat. One cannot forget the figures. During the 1941 winter, 
The Waffen SS lost 43,000 men in front of Moscow. The regiment de Fuhrer fought almost literally to the last man. Only 35 men survived out of the entire regiment. The de Fuhrer men stood fast and no Soviet troops got through. They had to try to bypass the SS in the snow. This is how famous Russian General Vlasov was captured by the Totenkopf SS division. Without their heroism, Germany would have been annihilated by December 1941. Hitler would never forget it. He gauged the willpower that the Waffen SS had displayed in front of Moscow. They had shown character and guts. And that is what Hitler admired most of all, guts. For him, it was not enough to have intelligent or clever associates. These people can often fall to pieces, as we will see during the following winter at the Battle of Stalingrad with General Paulus. Hitler knew that only sheer energy and guts, the refusal to surrender, the will to hang tough against all odds would win the war. The blizzards of the Russian steppes had shown how the best army in the world, the German army, with thousands of highly trained officers and millions of highly disciplined men, was just not enough. Hitler realized they would be beaten, that something else was needed, and that only the unshakable faith in a high ideal could overcome the situation. The Waffen SS had this ideal, and Hitler used them from now on at full capacity. From all parts of Europe, volunteers rushed to help their German brothers. It was then that was born the third great Waffen SS. First there was the German, then there was the Germanic, and now there was the European Waffen SS. 125,000 would then volunteer to save Western culture and civilization. The volunteers joined with full knowledge that the SS incurred the highest death tolls. More than 250,000 out of one million would die in action. For them, the Waffen SS was, despite all the deaths, the birth of Europe. Napoleon said it in St. Helena. There will be no Europe until a leader arises. The young European volunteers had observed two things. First, that Hitler was the only leader who was capable of building Europe, and secondly, that Hitler, and Hitler alone, could defeat the world threat of communism. For the European SS, the Europe of petty jealousies, jingoism, border disputes, economic rivalries was of no interest. It was too petty and demeaning. Europe was no longer valid for them. At the same time, European SS, as much as they admired Hitler and the German people, did not want to become Germans. They were men of their own people, and Europe was a gathering of the various peoples of Europe. European unity was to be achieved through harmony, not domination over one of the others. I have discussed these issues at length with both Hitler and Himmler. Hitler, like all men of genius, had outgrown the national stage. Napoleon was first a Corsican, then a Frenchman, then a European, and then a singularly universal man. Likewise, Hitler had been an Austrian, then a German, then a greater German, then Germanic. Then he had seen and grasped the magnitude of building Europe. After the defeat of communism, the Waffen-SS had a solemn duty to gather all their efforts and strength to build a united Europe. And there was no question that non-German Europe should be dominated by Germany. Before joining the Waffen-SS, we had known very difficult conflicts. We had gone to the Eastern Front, first as adjunct units to the German army, but during the Battle of Stalingrad, we had seen that Europe was critically endangered. Great common effort was imperative. One night, I had an eight-hour debate with Hitler and Himmler on the status of non-German Europeans within the new Europe. For the present, we expected to be treated as equals fighting for our common cause. Hitler understood fully, and from then on, we had our own flag our own officers, our own language, our own religion, we had total equal status. I was the first one to have Catholic padres in the Waffen SS. Later, ministers of all denominations were available to all those who wanted them. The Islamic SS division had their own mullahs, and the French even had a bishop. We were satisfied that with Hitler, Europeans would be federated as equals. We felt that the best way to deserve our place as equals was in this critical hour to defend Europe equally as well as our German comrades. What mattered above all for Hitler was courage. He created a new chivalry. 
Those who earned the order of the Ritter Cruz, meaning the Cross of the Knights, were indeed the new knights. They earned this nobility of courage. Each of our units going home after the war would be the force that would protect the people's rights in our respective countries. All the SS understood that European unity meant the whole of Europe, even Russia. There had been a great lack of knowledge among many Germans regarding the Russians. Many believed that the Russians were all communists, while in fact Russian representation in the communist hierarchy was less than insignificant. They also believed that the Russians were diametrically opposite from the Europeans, yet they have similar familiar structures. They have an old civilization, deep religious faith, and traditions which are not like those of other European countries. The European SS saw the new Europe in the form of three great components. Central Europe as the powerhouse, Western Europe as the cultural heart, and the East as Europe's potential. Thus, the Europe the SS envisioned was alive and real. Its 600 million inhabitants would live from the North Sea to Vladivostok. It was in this span of 8,000 miles that Europe could achieve its destiny, a space for young people to start new lives. This Europe would be the beacon of the world, a remarkable racial ensemble, an ancient civilization, a spiritual force, and the most advanced technological and scientific complex. The SS prepared for the high destiny of Europe. Compare these aims and these ideals with the Allies. The Roosevelts and the Churchills sold out Europe in Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam. They capitulated to the Soviets. They delivered half of the European continent to communist slavery. They let the rest of Europe disintegrate morally without any ideal to sustain it. The SS knew what they wanted. The Europe of ideals was salvation for all. This faith in higher ideals inspired 400,000 German SS, 300,000 Volksdeutsch or Germanic SS, and 300,000 other European SS, volunteers all, one million builders of Europe. The ranks of the SS grew proportionately with the growth of the war in Russia. The nearer Germany was to defeat, the more volunteers arrived at the front. This was phenomenal. Eight days before the final defeat, I saw hundreds of young men join the SS on the front. Right to the end, they knew they had to do the impossible to stop the enemy. So the 180 men strong Liebstandart in 1933, to the SS regiments before 1939, to the three regiments in Poland, to the three divisions in France, to the six divisions at the beginning of the Russian War, to the 38 divisions in 1944, the Waffen-SS reached 50 divisions in 1945. The more the SS died, the more others rushed to replace them. They had faith and stood firm to the extreme limit. The exact reverse happened in January 1943 at Stalingrad. The defeat there was decided by a man without courage. He was not capable to face danger with determination, to say, I will not surrender. I will stand fast until I win. But he was morally and physically gutless, and he lost. A year later, the SS Viking and the SS Wallonia divisions were encircled in the same way at Cherkasy. With the disaster of Stalingrad fresh in the minds of our soldiers, they could have been subject to demoralization. On top of it, I was laid down with a deep side wound and a 102 degree temperature. As general in command of the SS Wallonia forces, I knew that all this was not conducive to high morale. I got up, and for 17 days, I led charge after charge to break the blockade engaged in numerous hand-to-hand -hand combats, was wounded four times but never stopped fighting. All my men did just as much and more. The siege was broken by sheer SS guts and spirits. After Stalingrad, when many thought that all was lost, when the Soviet forces poured across Ukraine, the Waffen SS stopped the Soviets dead in their tracks. They retook Charkov and inflicted a severe defeat on the Soviet army. This was the pattern. Over and over, the SS would turn reverses into victories. The same fearless energy was also present in Normandy. General Patton called them the proud SS divisions. The SS was the backbone of resistance in Normandy. Eisenhower observed, the SS fought as usual to the last man. The SS Hitler Jugend division was made up of the youngest Germans from 16 to 18 years of age. They fought with equal heroism as their elder comrades. 
Only 600 of them survived while resisting the Allied onslaught. But just three weeks after the staggering loss, they had reformed and were at full strength in the Battle of Ardennes, a feat which threw the Allies into a general panic. If the Waffen-SS had not existed, Europe would have been overthrown entirely by the Soviets by 1944. They would have reached Paris long before the Americans. The Waffen-SS heroism stopped the Soviet juggernaut at Moscow, Cherkov, Cherkasy, and Tarnopol. The Soviets lost more than 12 months. Without SS resistance, the Soviets would have been in Normandy before Eisenhower. The people showed deep gratitude to the young men who sacrificed their lives. Not since the great religious orders of the Middle Ages had there been such selfless idealism and heroism. In this century of materialism, the SS stand out as a shining light of spirituality. I have no doubt whatever that the sacrifices and incredible feats of the Waffen-SS will have their own epic poets like Schiller. Greatness in adversity is the distinction of the SS. The curtain of silence falls on the Waffen-SS, but now more and more young people somehow know of its existence and of its achievements. Their fame is growing and the young demand to know more. In 100 years, almost everything will be forgotten, but the greatness and the heroism of the Waffen-SS will be remembered. It is the reward of an epic.